Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, I reveal Ben's phobia. Speaking to the BBC, Ben says, thanks Doug. Thanks Doug. And I try to create some hype. And it's the one you've all been waiting for. Starting off the news this week is yet another SpaceX Starship test, with the SN11 completing another run yesterday. This time, however, the prototype blew up a little earlier than it has done in the past, with an issue causing an explosion shortly after the landing burn began. We haven't been told much about what happened after the footage from the livestream cut off, although we do know that there was a separate but manageable issue with the chamber pressure in one of the engines beforehand. Hopefully more will be revealed in the coming days, and SpaceX will, as they have with their other tests, be able to turn this into a learning exercise rather than a failure. In other news, a study published in the journal Circulation has found that spending a prolonged period in space can actually shrink the human heart. The study looked at an endurance swimmer and an astronaut, and how these professions affected the heart, finding that because the gravitational loading on the heart was lessened, the heart reacted and shrunk. Speaking to the BBC, Dr Benjamin Levine summed it up well by saying that the heart is remarkably plastic, and that it adapts to the load that's placed on it. So in space, you no longer have to pump blood uphill, because you're not pumping against gravity. Naturally, this study will be significant to those planning for longer journeys in space, namely to the Moon for longer periods of time, and to Mars. While astronauts do spend a long time on the ISS, with the average being around six months and the record being nearly a year, a mission to another planet will take much longer, and this will have to be one of the many aspects of an astronaut's health that will have to be considered. Jumping back to the past now, and our long gone relatives, the Neanderthals. A study published this week in the journal Journal of Human Evolution has found evidence that Neanderthals were using toothpicks around 45,000 years ago. The study looked at two hominin teeth that were discovered in 2010, and the researchers say that it appears that the owner of these teeth used a toothpick as an early attempt at some oral hygiene, possibly using a twig or a piece of bone for this role. After careful study of the tooth, the researchers determined that the evidence pointed to it having belonged to a Neanderthal over 30 years ago. And now over to Ben, sporting a suspicious new addition to his set. Thanks Doug. Also in the paleontology news of the last week has been an interesting study describing the first definite remains of ichthyosaurs found from Antarctica. Ichthyosaur fossils have been noted from Antarctic formations before, but this is the first time they've been properly described with all three of the described specimens coming from the late Jurassic. One of these individuals has been referred to Ophthalmosauridae, and in addition to the Antarctic reptiles, two specimens from Madagascar have been re-evaluated and a third one newly described that provides paleontologists with all sorts of new information about the roles of seaways at this time in Earth's history. Adding support to the idea that ancient marine vertebrates such as ichthyosaurs were dispersing along the Mozambique corridor after the breakup of the supercontinent Gondwana in the Jurassic. And finally for this week's news is the naming and description of a new genus and species of a bellysaurid dinosaur. Named Leucalcan Eleocranianus, the fossil material comes from a late Cretaceous aged formation in northwestern Patagonia, with its name meaning the one who causes fear in Mapuche. Interestingly, this dinosaur was very similar to another abelisaur that inhabited the same time and place in Patagonia, Via Veneta. However, numerous features of the skull show that it was indeed distinct from this taxon. The Leucalcan individual was likely a subadult when it died, and the fact that two abelisaurs were coexisting at this time further shows that these theropods were one of the most important, if not the main predators of the ecosystems of late Cretaceous Patagonia. Always great to have more abelisaurid discoveries. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. That's it for 7 Days of Science this week. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday. And it's the one you've all been waiting for. <laughs>